education. Um, yesterday, um, several of us advisors to the NRNB had a chance to um, uh, see uh, progress being made uh, in Cytoscape and NRNB. And um, uh, we, we did this about a year ago, a year and a half ago, and in San Diego, it was pretty impressive. But I, I have to say that um, uh, we came out of yesterday pretty uh, psyched up with comments from uh, excellent to, to awesome. And, and I think in the audience, um, Kai, is Kai in the audience? Um, she should, right, I hope uh, you know Kai. Is Barry in the audience? Kay. Kay. And and uh, Barry? Yeah, so Barry, uh, uh, Kay, um, in terms of uh, what they've been doing in Cytoscape 3, and then uh, Rotaro, who we've decided is superhuman, is somewhere in, in, in the audience. I just I want to signal out the, those people before I get, get going. So I, I think as a scientist, the, the most critical uh, question you can ask um, is, how to frame a question, right? You, you know, Gwyn, you can work on any question, you work on any problem, but the real puzzle is how to frame that question. And behind it is also something to think about, which is um, not just how we frame the question, but how we tackle them. And that, that's what I'm gonna uh, talk about today. Um, I'm gonna give you, to start out with, five things that you're aware of, but as we're all passengers at this time in, th in this uh, sort of, uh, transition um, that's going on. Sometimes um, it's worth pointing these out. I think you'll see why. So the first is um, the concept of the massive amount of, of omics information. It's probably in some ways, you know, the most frequently included uh, comment. But I have to start there because just pause for a second and think of what you were doing three years ago and what's going to be done uh, um, three years from now. So thread that together with the fact that uh, now, not just in yeast, not just in bacteria, um, the ability to build um, network as representations, as an alternative to bottoms-up systems biology has, uh, I think, uh, begun, at least we can say, to emerge. The third, and again, I'm not sure how many uh, think about this, is the difference between having a large storage uh, capacity and putting it all some one place and actually having it available in the cloud for everyone to get to fundamentally can change how, how we're working on things. The next that um, I've been really impressed with the last year is the gadgets, the sensors, the tools that are now uh, going in people's hands who are going, hey, I could capture this, I could capture that. And then uh, um, the other compliment is who's doing what. That is the concept that you don't have to be an expert, that a citizen can uh, engage in, in, in an activity, and um, that with 99.9% .9 of the people working on something are, are duds, you can still do brilliantly with that 0.01% and, and how to put that together. So I think um, one of the puzzles we've been working on is how do you thread those two together? And I, I would argue that if you're in any group and you're not taking advantage of all five of those, then you're probably not getting at enough out of what's going on. So if you haven't figured out a way to actually leverage all of those uh, basically transitions that are going in, on in front, in front of us, probably not, someone else is going to zip by you in your field. And the question is, you know, there's a huge opportunity and, and a huge uh, responsibility. Um, and yet, um, uh, I, I think um, there are some illusions that we have about where we are in the process of understanding uh, disease. So when you see a uh, visual illusion like this, I think people um, know what an illusion is. They, they, they can recognize it. But we're surrounded by, and I'm going to go to three or four of these illusions. The first is uh, has to do with uh, drugs and how hard it is to make them work, and in fact, how well, they, how well they work. And we get these ads on television saying, beware of the counterfeit drugs from Canada, or this, or that, or generics won't work as well. I think the real illusion here is that, as I think you know, virtually all drugs work in a minority of the patients that take them, okay? There are exceptions, but a majority of drugs work in a minority of the people who are taking them. And um, um, uh, more importantly, those drugs, when they're given, are actually not treating the disease. Uh, they're often treating the, the symptoms, not, not the disease. And um, the concept of um, that expectation and what, what is there is something I, th I want you to keep in mind. And uh, I spent eight years uh, running uh, discovery uh, development in, uh, in Merck at a pharmaceutical company. So it's something that I have, have some familiarity with between this illusion of 
you know, the drugs out there work well and relatively easy now uh, to develop them. Even when a tool gets here and talks about the ease of repurposing drugs, okay, keep that in mind. Um, the next um, is um, this concept that, thank God, we're now um, the chosen ones with all the information and, and it's going to be straightforward to, to solve uh, uh, what is in uh, front of us. I think that, you know, the cytoscape, <coughs> um, sorry, I'm just kidding, um, descriptions of networks that are, that are up here um, and sort of how we picture what's uh, going on gives us an illusion that we know function and what's going on there. And again, it's, it's nice to have those representations, uh, but um, if you look at sort of what it really looks like and, and what it, uh, you, know, it, you should be being more and more humbled by the complexity than being impressed with how well models are, are, are fitting together. And again, uh, before that, I spent eight years uh, running, uh, uh, founding, running uh, Rosetta Informatics and uh, have, some, again, some familiarity with the, what I'd say is the evolving but yet still really primitive stages of being able to form functional uh, uh, models. Um, the next is that I think um, if you listen uh, to the East, uh, you'd like to, uh, I think the NIH and other funding agencies would like to think that the three billion that they spend every year is, w they're well suited to actually migrate into this uh, uh, era, that the uh, concept that they are the ones who are actually going to be well, well positioned to do this. And I'm going to argue here um, that until we change the current reward systems, until people are not rewarded for holding back data, but can be uh, figuring out how to share, and this is the type of thing I'm about to go into, um, it's going to be hard to um, assume that, in fact, uh, that's going to work. And um, we'll keep having postdocs, graduate students, go to labs like they go to uh, play Warhammer games where you go to someone who has the most information and you go, well, we're thankfully have more information than they and we have more tools. And th this concept that we aren't all actually working on the same thing at the same time uh, prevents that, uh, that type of uh, uh, process from happening faster. And again, <laughs> has spent some time in, in institutions. So this is the end of the intro. I'm going to argue that we are basically where chemistry was in the 18th century in the age of alchemy. We like to think that we really know what's going on, but we're basically where the chemists were before the periodic table. And I think one of the questions to think about is what would a periodic table look like? What are the rules that are required to understand how, and not just what is there, not who, what protein talks to what protein, or what does a pathway look like, but more about the rules for why cells are doing what they are, et cetera. And um, the uh, last point around this way is, uh, this is for Trey from yesterday, um, that is Aristotle's um, treatise, um, which for about a thousand years was used as the truth. It was used as the gold standard. And I think similarly, the concept of a go ontology as being a gold standard and we would measure things against a static ontology like that, fortunately, is being uh, shattered by papers such as the Eidecker uh, uh, papers looking at dynamic, okay, uh, ontologies actually built from facts, <laughs> built up from facts, um, uh, meaning ex in, within an experiment. So. Um, Institute of Medicine, last December, basically a year ago, put out a very important report, actually worth uh, reading, which is about how is medicine going to make a transition out of the age of symptoms and into what they call precision medicine. What is that new taxonomy going to look like? More importantly, what is it going to take to actually get to that taxonomy? Um, and sitting in there um, were um, various clues as to um, integration, how to do that, building knowledge uh, uh, networks. The two major ways that people are expecting when they're in institutions now that they're going to get there are that current institutions, whether they are universities um, or whether they're uh, foundations, are going to actually, as they have in the past, be the primary drivers of understanding that precision medicine. And I think there's a counter chorus among private companies like 23andMe, like patients like me, that say that we are in a position, actually better position, if you can just give us your data, we will in a proprietary way solve what's going on. What I'm going to argue is that those are key ways to actually shift in terms of how we're doing precision medicine, but um, what would happen if it was complemented by um, certain new ways of working together? So, 
the, this is a classic situation where the question is, is it in the, to the benefit of various individuals to share, to put things in a place where everyone can get at them, get to them and work uh, with them? Um, are we in a situation where it's actually um, reasonable to want to live, to want to be within a biomedical uh, information uh, commons? So three years ago, I left Merck. Uh, and um, what we've uh, started this nonprofit foundation. And what we've really been, been interested in is we, we believe that there's uh, soon coming a, a way in which open collaborative um, research can be done and where the patients are actually driving that information with partners, with experts um, in, in ways that are um, uh, much more efficient. Um, and um, I'm not going to go through, I'm going to give you some examples soon, but basically we have a series of collaborations that we've been working on to show what you can do in that. We've been building platforms, which I'm going to highlight, and um, also um, looking at, at different ways of doing training. Um, we've been really fortunate. We have about 21 uh, uh, partners, um, public, private funders. So one of the nice things is to be a nonprofit foundation and have the resources to, to, to act and, 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 and go sort of where you want to go. And we break these ideas, or at least what is needed to live in an information commons, into issues about building impactful models, governance, the technology platform and the challenges. And I'm going to sort of go quickly through, I'm going to do a little bit on models, quickly to governance, technology platform and challenges, and then show you what it looks like uh, at the end of that. Um, so I shifted the deck here because we're at the Gladstone. I thought it would be interesting to show something in, in Alzheimer's, also because this paper uh, I think is coming out this week or next week in Cell. So this is a, a project that Chris Gaitari has been doing in Alzheimer's. And as you probably know, um, there are two recurring problems in, in Alzheimer's disease. Um, one is um, whether um, the changes that you're seeing are actually um, ones that are uh, effects of destruction, they're adaptive, or are they both? And trying to find causal um, uh, factors is difficult in Alzheimer's. And uh, secondly, there's so many different mechanisms that you could consider to be important. One of the, the puzzles you have is how could you look at this difference between what's going on um, in mutations, the environment, and, and see how that could uh, affect the core pathology? So um, this work, as I said, that Chris Gaitari has done has three parts, but this is for those who are modelers to see sort of like how we think when we build uh, models. So in this instance, uh, Chris started with identifying co-expressed modules. Um, looking at those that were co-expressed, calculated for disease in healthy groups, and um, uh, basically um, uh, grouping those in terms of modules um, that here I've, I've put on the bottom is color-coded. Then he went in and he said, let's prioritize those modules and let's look at it in terms of the difference in, for Alzheimer's between normal and uh, in Alzheimer's. Let's prioritize those um, by looking at the um, uh, clinical measures, the tendency to reconfigure themselves within the disease, did a ranking that way. And then asked, by looking at genetic information and layering that on top, to look at uh, specific uh, relationships uh, that were directed relationships between the genes, basically to infer causal relationships and hierarchical structures, basically incorporating eSNP information. And uh, again, no hairballs here. So what that does is that allows you to go through and come up for different aspects of the function of the cells and different uh, parts of the brain. Um, ask, are there some uh, sets of genes that seem to be driving certain biologic processes, particularly um, in, in, in Alzheimer's disease? And um, in this paper, one I think the main points that, that, that was interesting, but I think is timely in the last three months, is that a lot of these cellular processes were actually ones related to inflammation. Okay? The A-beta work is there, dot, 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 dot. But the real drivers that, that we're picking up in many of these processes are actually inflammatory ones. And um, he went on and basically transformed those uh, descriptions of those networks into biologic hypotheses and went through and started asking which one of these hypotheses makes sense or not. And there was a core one that we were interested in that, high, that stood out on Tyro BP and TREM2. And um, so to, to look at that, um, worked with a group in Germany and um, being able to um, look at knockout um, and um, using uh, insertions and 
truncated versions of tyro BP versus vector controls, looking at what happens with or without microglia. Um, the story that ju just is coming out shows that tyro BP, critical to looking at function, and actually only when the microglia are in the presence of those uh, cells that, that, you're, uh, that you're following. So where that project is going is to take those gene regulatory networks, look then at microcircuity and neuronal diversity, and combine that with the data that we have on patients on diffusional spectrum imaging and seeing if that actually helps to make even more coherent uh, prioritizations of the genes that, that are involved uh, in, in that disease. The second on governance, I'm going to skip for here other than to say this one thing. So you may know that if you're going to share data, put it into the, uh, a place where others can use, um, whether it's HIPAA or whether it's privacy laws at institutions, et cetera, it's, there are lots of restrictions, which I think of as veils behind the fact that most people really don't want to share their data. Um, and so we've been working on ways to actually make that more feasible. John Wilbanks, who um, was at Creative Commons, who's uh, joined us at SAGE, um, uh, has built out a process called portable legal consent, which takes the control of data away from saying this should be held by the institution, saying why can't the patient themselves hold that control? And if they hold the control, then they can say that they're willing to, to share it. So there's a nice TED talk that you can get to um, that he had. You also can go to weconsent.us if you're interested in that. So assuming that you have this data that you're interested in building the models, that was the impactful models part, and assuming that there are ways, and I went incredibly briefly uh, through uh, the concept of governance, the, the still the question is, if you wanted to have teams of teams working together to solve problems, um, what would they need in terms of technology and incentives to actually work more in teams instead of saying, I'm saving this till I'm the first author paper on a one-name journal, right? So the question is, how do you help that transition that you know is critical to speeding up uh, um, d discovery? And one of the things we felt was a, a, a real bottleneck in this is how we communicate and how we get recognized. So if you only recognize people when they, put, uh, when they get their name in a journal and how much it's cited, what do you expect them to do? Okay. So for hundreds of years, right, the way to say, I have done something, is to publish it as a journal. The question is, um, are there other ways to get recognition, microattribution, um, who's worked on what? And the software engineer, as probably many of you in the audience, uh, thankfully, more than, than I usually uh, uh, speak to, um, know that um, GitHub and other structures which allow code changes, issues to be tracked, allow people to have provenance, um, is a very effective way in getting people willing to work with others because, in fact, if you do, the recognition you get is my thing was used by many. That's what you want to hear, not my thing was freeloaded or free-rided or stolen by someone. So I think the, the thing we were asking was, how do you build something that actually is a GitHub for, uh, um, for um, biomedical uh, data? and um, should be able to have data and code versioned, should be able to take the models that you're building and the code, put it out there, and go who did what with it, and um, uh, should be um, something that also has the leaderboards, recognition, things like that. So th that's what, uh, for the last two years, Mike Kellen and his group has, have been working on, has been uh, making sure that the data analysis in Synapse, which is what I'm now, now going to talk about, um, can run on any tool, you can put it on any platform, um, can, can be able to, to record it. And basically, the concept is, can we build a compute platform for transparent, reproducible, modular, uh, collaborative biomedical uh, uh, research? So currently, if you go on to Synapse, which is really still somewhere between alpha and, and, and beta release, um, there are 16,000 data sets you can see on the corner, um, various types of data that's in there. Um, GEO is in there, um, TCGA, CCLE, et cetera. And um, there are about a million models that now sit on Synapse. So uh, this is not ready for prime time, but we've been working with certain groups to see sort of how, how can we uh, give that type of uh, provenance. You can download analyses, you can do meta-analysis, this works in, uh, in, uh, in R, but it doesn't have to work in R. The most important thing is you can do your work in a way that others can see and um, visualize it in uh, tools like you know what. Um, so 
Um, David Halser has been really helpful um, this past year in working with his group. And so we've been taking the TCGA data and asking, how can it be something other than Excel sheets? How could you move? How could you have people working and coming up with uh, projects? So to do that, you've got to come up with something that everyone's interested. So the um, along with uh, uh, David Hauser's group, we've been working on a pan-cancer collaborative uh, discovery project that brings in a lot of centers. And what they've been doing is figuring out how can they use Synapse to reuse, to evaluate, and to have people tracking long before it was ever um, uh, uh, published, sort of who, who was, uh, was, was doing what. To give you an example of a project that uh, highlights this that was done by Adam Marglin, some of you may know there's extensive work on the cancer cell lines that were done um, by um, the, the Broad and um, uh, Novartis and the CCLE. And then there was work at MGH, Jeff Settleman, Genentech, and um, uh, uh, working with, uh, at MGH uh, that is sitting over here. And we were interested to take and actually see if you could simultaneously show both those data sets and then take individual ways of um, looking at variations or looking at uh, relationships, such as prediction um, that could be improved by discretizing the data or including or not including expression data or using elastic net regression and actually show that you could do it on multiple people's data and, and present it for other people to look at. Again, giving uh, credit but allowing people to evolve that uh, in, in real time. Uh, the next project, which has been funded by the Sloan Foundation, is to ask how close are we to making it so that journal editors are willing to accept papers and, in fact, say the only time they're going to accept a paper is when the model and the code for the model is put in and actually able to be reviewed and showed re reproducible. So this is a project that uh, has been done by Eric Wan and Brian Bott and David Burdick. And what they've been asking is, how do you make it so that um, instead of um, having a, a new paper <laughs> needed with brand new data to, to, to validate what someone's doing, can you track and, and can you sort of um, have people responsible for the components that are in papers in a way where the code, the data, the models, the figures, and the capsules are all the way you would submit a paper? So Nature Genetics, PLOS, uh, Science Translational Medicine, two other journals I can't remember, have all gotten together and we're working on a way where the projects that go on in basically computational biology and other areas, you would have a, a tool or a way to actually say, this is what we did, and others could look at it and, 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 and work, work with it in, in that way. So we began having an ability to have a geek sandbox, Synapse. We began to have provenance began to have ways of, um, uh, of, of, um, tr of sort of tracking who was doing what. So um, you may know that last July, um, we started a challenge to ask, could you get people, how best to get people to share data? So this is a project where we went and took the data out of a nature paper that came out in May. Um, 2,000 women with breast cancer had clinical data for 15 years and um, uh, had SNP analysis, copy number variation, sorry, and um, expression profiling. And we put a challenge out there and said, can anyone build a better classifier than the ones that were out there? So you may know that 10 years ago uh, with uh, NKI, we built one, came out in Nature and New England Journal about 10 years ago. That turned into Oncotype DX and Mammaprint. The question was, can you do a better, will the crowd do a better job? <laughs> if you put this out, can, can you do a better job? So 2,000 uh, um, uh, 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 samples were in the uh, training set. We went to Nor Norway and found a couple of hundred, uh, more like 300 samples, which no one had ever seen that we used as a validation set to keep from overfitting. And um, on the first day, without announcing this, we had 27 countries, 154 participants, calling in to learn about it. And the reason they were, which is important to put in here, is that we got Google to say that they would host all of the code, all the structures um, for free. They would make a thousand core cluster available for anyone who wanted to use any of the data. So you, if you were wanting to work up there, everyone can work in the same place, you could store it. We went to science, translational medicine, and got it so that there would be a guaranteed paper for the winner with no peer review. So we said, why do you have peer review when you've won the competition. The bottom threshold for it was that actually you had to beat a certain set of people who ordinarily would have gotten that in as a paper. 
And then we said, if you can beat that, why have peer review? So Science Translational Medicine agreed to that. Incidentally, we have now four different journals who have said, we will let you run competitions and challenges without peer review to get uh, papers into journals such as uh, Nature. So we, we think that this is an interesting thing. Um, by September, uh, actually six weeks in, <laughs> A Chinese uh, working in New York blew out the groups at Stanford and Harvard and other places. Okay, we thought this is pretty cool, right? So we wanted to know how long would it take for a group to blow out the groups that are usually getting the NIH grants, usually being uh, well funded, and this person was doing it for free. And um, so in the end, we had almost 2,000 models. Um, this uh, was a, a, a person uh, working at Columbia. I'm just interested whether anyone knows Demetrius um, or that group in Columbia. I just, I, I want to you know, prove to myself each time that these are not well-known people. <laughs> um, more importantly, you've got to go and look at what they ended up uh, doing because this tool and this approach that they took was actually a fundamentally different one and they got very interested in a, it, it highlighted a pathway uh, at EMT, at uh, epithelial uh, mesenchymal transition that the, 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 we announced the winner and it, I don't know if you saw three weeks ago, four weeks ago, the paper that just came out which was really hot about the importance on aggressiveness in breast cancer related to that. I just really like the fact that this was not only the winner in the competition, but actually matched uh, an, a, an important theme biologically. Sometimes you can get really cool on the analytic side, but it's not sort of nice when, when it's working biologically. Okay, so that's good, but what we've been working on last year is really how do you disrupt the system? How do you build a way for patients themselves, citizens, to actively engage and bring in their real-time information and um, feel as if they're the partners. Not that there are some experts up there that are trying to solve their, uh, their problems, but how do you actually have a, more of a partnership? Because we're concerned that the phenotypic data is not nearly rich enough today to match the genotypic data. So I think the genotypic data has gone like this. The phenotypic data, especially when you're going off of electronic medical records and crap like that, right, it's just not going to give you insights. So what we've been thinking about is how could you get citizens to be functioning as patients, as funders and scientists, and go completely outside of the NIH system, go completely out of the normal way, and actually have people come up with, I care about autism, or I care about depression, or I care about uh, my, my form of breast cancer, and work together with those people who have real energy, they're, they're willing to do almost anything. So the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has been funding us to work on five projects um, that have to go from very rare populations, a couple of thousand people in the whole country, through to um, work in diabetes. And I want to pick two because I'm going to try to get across what I mean by what is it to, to basically disrupt the current system. So if we were going to do breast cancer genomic research these days, we would take isolated breast cancer cohorts. This is what all the NIH money, NCI money goes to. Fund the researchers, the data is siloed, um, then comes to a point where um, the clinical and genomic data basically are accessible but minimally usable. There's little incentive to share because really what you're trying to do is to get to, uh, to your papers. It takes about six or seven years to wind your way through that process and go in for your next five-year renewal. Um, imagine that we actually, and this is a project that's live and going forward um, with uh, Larry Norton, with Fabrice Andre, with Jose Baselgo. So basically, the Olympic gods in uh, um, the breast cancer area have been uh, uh, helping us with this. Is to say, why don't we go and find the patients who've had particular therapies and have responded in certain ways, and have them go get their samples and get that analysis not because it was in a clinical trial, but actually going out and reaching out to the actual patients, getting those samples, pulling in that data, um, building up a place where everyone is, is able to get to that, um, run challenges off of that, run those competitions, and make a loop that basically is going between the patients um, and, and the clinics um, in, using rapid learning. Second example, last example, um, is that um, Melanoma is a disease which goes from uh, being sort of an odd uh, discoloration on your skin to being potentially lethal when it reaches the thickness of your skin nail, right? So your thumbnail um, thickness is, is basically where it can shift from being indolent to, to aggressive. Um, 
there are um, millions of patients who go to their local uh, doctor or they go to a dermatologist and um, they get uh, should, should not be biopsied. Um, and that's done by someone going, I think I, f I feel, uh, this looks like something I better biopsy. Okay, this is very important. There's no chart, there's no expert uh, thing standard that you go to. It's just, I learned in medical school when I saw this that I should do this. At that point, is or is not biopsied. 19 out of 20 biopsies actually didn't need to be done. Okay? But among those that are done, and actually the pathology reads it as a uh, melanoma, the next thing that happens is that 9 out of 10 of those were indolent and actually only one of those is lethal. And, and we basically have no way to shift that 19 to 20 or that 1 in 10. So um, the, the puzzle was, can you build a more efficient uh, uh, system? To do that, what, we're, what we've been working um, with a number of groups to uh, pull this off is to go to, to patients, and this is a project that's going to roll out in, in May, uh, next May, and ask patients who have melanoma to go and get the photograph that they had of their lesion, go get the digital path image of their section, and the outcome, meaning how many years since that happened and, and uh, did, did that end up having a lethal or an in indolent disease? Because you've got to build your code. You've got to build your, your set of, uh, um, of knowns. This is, is not. So we think that it should be, uh, um, let's see, where am I going next on this? Yeah. So we think it should be possible um, because uh, of being able to store this in the cloud to get thousands, then tens of thousands to a million of these images. We've talked to groups like DARPA who want to do the pattern recognition from the digital histopath without um, saying, oh, this is an aplastic cell, an aplastic cell means this. So literally just going from the metadata that sits in the histopath, that sits in the uh, photograph, and, and, and the outcome. And when that starts happening, then whether it's using smartphones or certain demoscopy uh, processes, anyone in the world, whether you're in a rich or poor country, should be able to access that knowledge expert. And it makes a very different relationship from the guild of experts who do experiential knowledge to actually having a core set of standards. And I think this is a fundamental aspect of sort of how medicine is going to be able to, to go. This is like one of the more simple um, ways to, to, to do that. So I started with this concept that there were five things worth threading together. All this data that's coming out at the genomic level, the ability to use network modeling, the IT infrastructure and cloud compute, advantages of that, the ability for patients to say, I want to share the data, and allowing people who are not sort of, quote, experts to be able to solve the problems and, 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 and working uh, um, together. Where I think that can go is into dynamic, multi-scale patient communities enabling real-time learning using open approaches driven by infinite challenges. And the reason I, I pause, want to pause on this is um, there's a nice book by Jim Kars that is a mathematician that talks about finite and infinite games. And the point that he makes in a series of uh, proofs or uh, descriptors, 90-some, um, is um, that there are two things you can do in life. Uh, you can engage in something as if it's a finite game or an infinite game. What he means by a finite game is that there's a beginning, there's an end. There's a winner, there's a loser. There are um, rules you can stop uh, finite games. Infinite games do not have beginnings and ends. Do not have a necessarily a winner because it's an infinite uh, game. And right now, we run our labs uh, we run our research, uh, we do our biomedical research as if it's a series of finite games, when in fact it's an infinite game. And we have reward structures that work pretty well as for, for finite games, but not for infinite games. And so we need to work on ways where people who are making insights can actually find those incentives uh, and, and, and rewards. And um, this is a slide that is going back and forth between Eric Schott, I think Joel Dudley uses this, um, uh, we have a version. Wh where we see this uh, going is imagine the same way you have for a GPS um, and you want to go from one city to another and you can track where you are as you're going along. 
what it would take to actually have contour maps that were between health and states of disease. That's what we should be thinking about in terms of solving. And if we're going to, that's, that's the infinite game, is how do you build those contour maps? And if we think of it as that's what we're working on, not we're trying to solve this small thing, but th keep it at that level of, of playing for, for, for that, I think there's a chance we could do uh, uh, better. So first question I would get asked probably is why did I use the uh, phrase corruption of uh, denial? October uh, 2nd, I was in New York working with uh, another Ashoka fellow from India, and I asked him, um, Subi, uh, uh, is, uh, what do you think of corruption in, in, in India versus uh, China? And he turned to me and he said, um, well, I like to think of uh, two types of corruption. I like to think of corruption, uh, sort of fancy corruption, which is where money passes hands or someone gives some big uh, gift. And he goes, I don't care about fancy uh, corruption. <laughs> um, there's a harder corruption, which is the corruption of denial. The corruption of denial is when you live your life in a way where your very convenient way among your reward system, among how you're working, where you're very happy, but you actually aren't acknowledging the reality of, of what is there. The reason why I use the phrase corruption of denial is that I think we are subject to a corruption of denial about the complexity of the systems. I put a little challenge out uh, over beer last night. Give me any go fact, and I will come back and show you where it's wrong. Okay. We don't, and we just don't understand context, and we're not willing to accept the importance of context um, when we build our, our models, and, and we need to pay more attention to that. Secondly, scientists are invariably optimists. I don't think it's because they're trying to, I don't think they're sales people. I don't think it's because they want to pretend that we're about to have problems. But we should not be um, going about things saying we've just about figured out Alzheimer's. Or we've just about figured out how to treat this or, or that. Um, so I think that hurts when, when we're basically denying that. Um, the concept of what is sufficient for being able to understand diseases goes beyond um, what any one institution can uh, gather. The reason why I left Merck, left these other groups, was that I got to the point where I had budgets of hundreds of millions of dollars. Right? So I had budgets of hundreds of millions of dollars, and I realized that wasn't enough <laughs> to put on a problem. And we have to acknowledge that these are ways where we're going to, it's unaffordable to actually solve some of these problems unless we begin to figure out ways of sharing and, 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 and building those uh, models together. And it's not going to happen unless citizens themselves start going, hey, I will help you. I'll give you information. I'll let you strap these things on my body. Um, I'll give you my insights. I, I might actually know something about it because I have the disease. And then uh, last, I think um, that um, we have to set up ways where the person who has the idea is not the only person who is able to build the models. I think we have to have a way where anyone who generates the data should as rapidly as possible be in a position to let all that data be seen by, by many. And it shouldn't be a closed loop between those that generate the data and who gets to, to, to publish the, the paper on them. So um, that's the end. Um, I, um, this, I just want to end with this um, next April. Um, we are having our fourth SAGE Congress, and uh, last year, and we'll do it again this year, um, whether you live in Asia, Europe, or um, Palo Alto, um, we'll pay for uh, travel for our top 10 young investigators who want to come to the Congress. So you have to put in a proposal. The, the website for doing that, just go SAGE Congress on Google, you'll, you'll get to it, but there's a form. So if you're interested in, in uh, sort of looking at a different world than my gene, my data, my paper, um, if you want to come here, Bob Young from Top Hat, Jane McCongle from Institute of the Future, um, Wada Kanfar is the co-founder of Al Jazeera, and I found him really helpful in thinking of how you free up uh, uh, data. If you want to talk to Patrick, or hear Patrick Meyer, who uh, did the work in Kenya, and then in Haiti and in uh, um, Japan on the using sensors and getting uh, citizens to map data. If you want to listen to Jennifer Palka, um, apply for one of those and uh, you're, uh, you'll get uh, 
your, your way paid for. So thanks very much. So, um, uh, so this was done with uh, Gustavo at Dream, and um, uh, I'm going to answer that, and then we'll go to something that I th you didn't bring up, but I think we did wrong. Um, but um, the um, Kaggle, um, which is a good group, we, we know them well. Guy Cavat, who works there now, there's is this medical person actually worked at Rosetta with me, so we've really looked at what Kaggle is doing. Kaggle has closed competitions. Okay. Oh. Um, they say they want to protect the idea, um, sort of, um, basically these people make money by winning multiple times, so they don't want to show what it is that's solving because they can keep making money every time if, if, if they uh, sort of keep that to themselves. And we don't think that is actually uh, necessarily a, a, a good behavior. So the next challenge, maybe skip one because I don't know if we're going to be able to get it together, but we've got two challenges uh, wrapping up. Um, we want to take and run and have Kaggle's experts um, tr working on it in a closed way and have the community working on it in an open way. And so you have the power and expertise of theirs, but they don't have the open, and you have the open uh, system working. Basically, um, we'll close that answer and then we'll go over and we'll run the other one. Um, and um, so I think we have to look for different ways, but we've been trying to look at, I, I would say we're not wedded to any type of uh, uh, structure, but we just think they should be open. The other quick thing is, I, I'm, I would raise this question is, I am not sure how to reward a winner. So when you look at the people actually at the top of the leader list, it's not one, there's usually three or four that are really close. <laughs> And I think we've got to come up with a way where um, you actually reward them working together. And I'm worried that if you tr just take the winner, um, that um, you, you hurt yourself and hurt those that are around it. So we've been thinking of alternate approaches and different rewards, but anyone who has ideas on how to actually encourage sharing and, and get rid of that error that I think was in the first one. I, I, sorry, I just want one follow-up. Can we actually get the Metabrix data from you? Yes. Um, the Metabrick data um, go on to the site where it is because the way they set it up was they had um, privacy rules about who could work with the data. And we said that in Synapse it will be whole, held this way and in the challenge. And so there's a phase transition from challenge and afterwards it being all available. So I think you can still go on to the challenge site because the validation set is being done and pull it down that way. But if you have any problem, anyone has any problem, let me know. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really but, nice idea. But, but at least one slide, I yeah. challenge people that, that oh. at least that next slide where, where as you guys recall, we went from sort of Cytoscape views of, of networks to more hand-drawn or hand-laid-out views of networks um, where, where you had lots of additional information and inferences possible and it's a basic flow, what do you know about the structure and function of each of the players, um, the 
what extent could we automate that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, if there's a question here, I, I, I'm sorry for, for, for going off the pulpit, but, but if the question would be, you know, um, what, what can we as a network analysis community bring most to, to help what you guys are saying? Yeah. I think that's an important um, uh, um, goal, and uh, the, the goal, I think, is uh, best phrased as the multiple views that come after uh, of what the biochemistry looks like, because I think that uh, that representation um, you uh, it was one version, so I think one of the things would be fun to have whether it's in Cytoscape or something else, is when you get to the end of your network view and you're going to then reflect it into something that's a more classical uh, picture, biochemical uh, picture, I would like to see sort of you know, five best variations on that because various people will think of it in different ways. So I think if you're going to do that projection, which is nice and it is hard, and I don't know quite how to do that, um, other than you just, uh, when you're an expert in the field, you, you make your, uh, your link, so it's not at all automated. But I'd like to see it not have to be one view. I don't think it will be.